So, welcome everybody. I'll just start while people come in with their coffees and waters. I hope you enjoyed this wonderful session. That was exciting. Um, I think we can rival that session with an even better one, um, and hopefully with lots of questions from the audience on the subject of biases in artificial intelligence. So a very controversial, intense, good, very applied uh, topic for us. Um, and I'm surrounded by what I would call explorers and practitioners of AI, which I'm pleased to introduce. And Suzanne uh, Brink works for Hireview, uh, a business that's been around since 2004, started really in uh, web-based and camera-based assessment, and has built an AI engine that helps her, uh, in collaboration with data scientists and engineers, um, work through assessments and the analysis of people in the context of interviews uh, and other similar situations, but she will talk more about that. Welcome, Suzanne. Um, we have Nayur here to my right. Uh, Nayur Khan is a partner at McKinsey, um, and he's also deeply involved in the work with one of our sponsors here today, Quantum Black, um, helping a wide range of clients and companies very practically scale up AI for their businesses. And he also takes a role in looking specifically at inclusion and diversity within that topic. So great to have you here, and thanks for joining us. Thank you. Great to be here. Um, Ryan, Ryan Sweeney, also with one of our sponsors, Rev.com, uh, runs business development for a business that's in the first place in the, in the business of storytelling, which I find really interesting, and AI, uh, text-to-speech software. Um, you'll tell us more about how that feeds into this discussion today as well. So thank you for, for joining us. And my own name is Sven Peterson. I work uh, for Egon Zender. I'm a partner in a firm that's been around for quite a while, uh, hiring senior leaders into boards and level reporting to boards. And I feel I'm here today because I sort of have to deal with the people at the most senior level who have to make sense of all of this. They need to provide the holding frame for their companies, for their organizations, to understand what all of this, what we're discussing today, really means. So with that, maybe let's dive in, Ryan, with some thoughts and findings that you can tell us about uh, at Rev.com. Sure, thank you. I'm actually going to utilize this podium here. Thank you, Sven, for the introduction and to the COGX organizers for setting the stage literally and figuratively for us to have some very important discussions around critical topics, including ethical AI. And if you've seen the news just in the last couple of days, you'll know that this continues to be a hot topic. Um, and especially after the last few years that we've had, um, we need this kind of communication and learning more than ever. So, so thank you again. And for the great weather, uh, you make the Southern California guy feel right at home. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll only be here for a few minutes, uh, hoping to help the stage uh, for our discussion with an illustrious panel. But before I do, I would like to acknowledge that I am a white male talking about bias, and white males have not been disproportionately disenfranchised by AI as it has for many other groups. My experience in this field comes solely via the lens of the work that we do at Rev.com um, and the meaningful first steps that we've made to mitigate bias in ASR technology, which stands for automated speech recognition, uh, which I'll talk a little bit more about uh, in a minute. And may I have the uh, slides up, please? My verbal cue. Mm -hmm. um, I'll start by saying that every human exhibits bias, surprise, surprise, to each their own, we all have them. If you look at this image and think of a call center with thousands of agents, each exhibiting his or own bias, um, what you actually have is a highly diversified, high variant output as it relates to bias on any specific input. It's expensive and complex, but it is diverse, not necessarily by design, but it's diverse. If you call that person and you don't connect, that person doesn't understand you, you just hang up, call back, and speak to someone else. Now, if you train an algorithm to replace or augment these call centers, as many CIOs and CEOs have done and will continue to do for obvious reasons, what you get is a scalable, uh, cost-effective solution, but if you're not careful, um, it won't have that glorious diversity that we had in the previous system. 
um, that you had with the system that had thousands of independently biased agents. Whatever bias is present in the algorithm will be applied at scale to all of its inputs. That's just really one example of where the shift to AI gets precarious. Um, the number of applications for which our voice is used is growing exponentially. Even just the pandemic has helped accelerate this further. The, the uh, in-person uh, communication that we've had has, has diverted aggressively to, to digital. Twilio, if anyone is familiar, the customer engagement platform alone uh, processes 40 billion call center interactions a year. That's one company over one year. Rev was started over 10 years ago with a mission to build great work from home jobs, which seems timely today. Um, we have over 70,000 what we call revers or freelancers transcribing content from customers in media, education, finance, healthcare, just to name a few. And a byproduct of that effort is arguably the best data set in the world for which to train our AI. The result is not only the most accurate engine on the market, but also the one that, that exhibits the least bias. By having an organically diverse uh, set of, of workers around the world transcribing mass amounts of audio from different voices around the world, we have one critical piece of what's required to build an ethical AI engine, just one piece. One example uh, of our work uh, applied in the real world is HireVue, and I'm, we're very lucky to have Suzanne Brink here from HireVue. Thank you. Uh, HireVue, as Sven said, is an enterprise hiring platform that's focused on fairness in the hiring process at scale. They analyze interviews to make suggestions about the best talent for the job, and it is paramount that the AI-driven transcript, as in many voice applications that we use um, whether we know it or not, that transcript helps inform prediction models and insights that result in the hiring or, or the decision not to hire someone. Um, for context, this is how our AI performs against some other providers. As you can see, um, uh, it, it's, it's not perfect, we're not perfect, uh, but uh, our mission is to collapse the dots in the bottom right-hand corner of each graph. And you can see that uh, Rev 1.0 to 2.0 is actually getting better it's a continual process um, to, to lessen the bias in our engine. This is just over the course of a year. Um, and by the way, I should say that uh, the low, lower is better when we're talking about word error rate in, this, in, in, the, ASR, uh, in the ASR world. So um, as I sort of cue the final cliche interconnected image, as um, many of us have probably seen at nauseum, um, as leaders of companies, when we make decisions about buying or building AI, the network effect is almost always greater than we realize. You as a leader of a company buy an AI product and, that, and that, that company that sold it to you uses your logo on their site or an employee posts on LinkedIn about this great AI that, that the company purchased or is now using. You are a trusted source and your decisions are the greatest form of influence. Um, so thank you for taking on this responsibility with us and with that, we'll, uh, we'll get to our panel. Super. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. That's uh, very informative. And I guess what we're talking about today is bias in, bias out, vis-a-vis -vis AI. So what are our biases also in creating the very AI that we're developing to get the bias out? And maybe my first question, Suzanne, is mm -hmm. does it work in the people's space? Does the AI that you work with help you get the biases out of hiring decisions? Uh, we'd like to believe so, for sure. I mean, I think it's it's an extreme that you're positioning. There's absolutely no bias. It is a little bit more nuanced than that. But in our um, in higher view, what we do is we it starts off with the data, right? As ev as everything does. So we start off with as diverse a data set as we can muster. And because we started as just an interviewing software company, we collected loads and loads of data from all over the world, from different ethnicities, different kinds of people, and we brought that in as a first step when we started to build those algorithms to then assess who is a strong candidate versus not. So it starts with that diverse data. It also goes into the kind of providers we choose to work with, where we do thorough research to make sure we get the best that's currently available, and RevAI is a great partner in that. Um, and then we take another step once we then start building our algorithms. Our algorithms are designed to predict performance in that interview. Mm. Um, but then we have to 
be realistic and, and, and look at our, not just assume that everything's gonna be hunky-dory just because we took those first steps. We go back in and we do often then find some subgroup differences and then we go in to mitigate that. Um, and then it becomes a balancing act in reality because we're on the one hand predicting that performance on the interview, on the other hand we're reducing the subgroup differences and thankfully we work in a very regulated space where we can say okay there are certain uh, standards we uphold, uh, four-fifths rule is one of those which I can explain later if we wanted to. Um, but we take all this criteria, we set a, a standard beyond that where we can um, and we end up hitting a spot that we believe is right, is ethical, and we're as transparent as possible on how to then use it in a way that doesn't end up adversely impacting anyone. It is a slightly more complicated story than just saying everything's gone, yay. Um, but we, uh, we get to a really solid point that in the end, if you compare it to the, the very basis of the alternative as a human evaluating your interview, we actually believe we have a better product there that's more fair and more balanced. Yeah. That sounds promising. Um, now you're inclusion, diversity, and AI. Uh, and tell us a bit about your thoughts on that. Um, actually, I, I want to pivot a little bit back and build on some, some of the previous questions. And I, mean, I know we're talking about bias in and bias out. But the f when working with organizations, the first question I always ask is, what's your definition of fair? Mm. Like, as an anchoring point, what's your North Star? Of fair, and if you look into the science and the research, it's very difficult to have one definition of fair. There's multiple definitions of fair. I always use a, like for leaders a simple example. If I have ten students in a class, you know, different genders, different backgrounds, different social economic conditions, and I have five suites, who do I reward? Mm. How do I make a decision of what fair is? And if I ask different individuals, maybe on the panel here or individuals in the audience. I'll get different answers. And why is that? Because there's not a, a there's not a consensus de definition of fairness, and B, everyone's got un uh, their, their own bias, their, un or their, their own unconditional biases, or their own unconscious biases. And this is a problem, because this is where it starts. Without a clear definition of what your product or what you're building is of fair, when you start going down to bias, and I, I'm not biased, or, I'm, or, uh, or some bias is okay, and some bias is discriminatory, so it, it's the discriminatory you want to avoid. But what is the ones that you're going to anchor on from a mathematical point of view as you build your models? And what is the ones that you're going to anchor your whole organization on and say, this is how we address fairness? Where it becomes more complex is fairness is att attracted to social constructs, or, or the society or the region you're in. So what's fair in the US might not be fair in the UK, might not be fair in China. So when you have a product or you're building something for an organization that needs to go global, you're going to have to have multiple definitions of fairness. So I thought I'd throw that in. <laughs> because then once we take that step, then we need to really think about inclusion and diversity. Because this is where a lot of the problems have happened, and this is why we've seen, especially in the, in the media, where, a, for example, um, we've seen uh, black patients discriminated against um, in, in algorithms built by I in the US at a huge scale because no one really looked at properly the data. It's, it's not that we were classified based on race. It was, a fact, it was a fact that there was a lack of a diversity and understanding. Or actually, there is a disparity here. There are social conditions. But because of lack of inclusion, lack, lack of diversity in building those algorithms, it was very difficult to spot until the it arise and was published in a, in a paper. So where I'm, I'm, I, I always come back to is ask the question on what is fair first. Then we go to bias, and then we go to, well, what's the team building here? What's the fairness of that team? And then we can dive into what, what do I mean by that. And at Quantum Black, who's asking that question? Um, this is a very good question. <laughs> so, so one, I, I, I do this, and we do this as, a, as an organization. Um, and whenever we're working with organizations, the first question is, well, you're building AI, well, what's the purpose? Who is it going to serve? Is it for a specific group or is it for a global group? And there's a question that we ask. And so we're really trying to anchor from a societal point of view is what is fair? And it's very kind of user directed, very persona directed. Um, but internally, what we also do is we focus a lot on making sure that our, um, um, the people working on projects or the, or, the, or the organizations we work with are diverse in nature, and we really try to encourage it. Now, it's always difficult because we always hear the same complaints that the, the pipeline or the funnel is not there. There's lack of diversity in the funnel, but my always comeback on that is, well, you're not looking wide enough. 
there is plenty of diverse candidates out there, especially in data science, data engineering, software engineering, product, user experience. I think the mic is cutting in and out. Um, but there's, there's plenty of diverse candidates out there. So I, 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 I think we ask questions, or we ask very hard questions, especially when we're talking about building AI that's going to impact individuals' lives. Um, one question for the three of you, but also Ryan maybe is, do you operate under the assumption of uh, bias-free is actually a desirable state, and is that actually possible? So just riffing on your more philosophical stance to say, is the target operating model one where you try to create a bias-free AI, is that a possibility? Mm -hmm. Because if we factor in also time, mm -hmm. it starts becoming uncontrollable because what we might think is no bias today was a bias in the past or it will be one in the future. But It, it is a little bit of a moving target. Um, I think we have aspirations for bias-free. Today, honestly, it's a, it may, be nar may seem narrow um, when you look at all the languages that we speak throughout the world, but our focus is really English and eliminating bias from our English um, model. Um, we have not quite gotten there with other languages, so it's a, it's a great challenge, mm. looking beyond. Yeah. Thank you. Um, one thing I thought about when you were speaking now was, was a bit the effect of unintended consequences. So you build the AI to the very best intentions, and then stuff happens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You didn't really predict. It just happens. This very clever engine spits something out. Tell me a bit about the surprises and co unintended consequences that you've seen. You mentioned one of them, but um, I don't know if there's anything that comes up for you guys. Yeah, I think um, uh, it, that is one of the bigger challenges, right? Because you, you start off not including demographics as a potential predictor. Let's be clear on that. So you don't bring in sort of saying male, female can be part of what the model picks up as, as a predictor of your desired outcome. But then the algorithm can still um, find proxies. Mm. And that's where you need to continue to monitor. So for us, it's I just explained how we kind of build our algorithms, but then at the back end of that, we continue to monitor. And we're not naive in thinking that now we designed it in a way we we did our best, we did our checks, now we're good. Mm -hmm. We then go back in and with every client on a yearly basis, we ask them for their demographics, we run what we call adverse impact analyses, and we look at their data. Mm -hmm. um, thankfully, often it looks good, but if there is something to address, we'll work with them to address it. So it's also a continuous monitoring piece. Um, just being aware that every data set is different, that we are working globally, and um, that there is no such thing as perfection just yet in this space. So. Yeah. <laughs> no, thank you. I don't know if you guess anything comes up. Well, I, I mean, 100%, uh, uh, there's no such thing as perfect. And I mean, we've seen recently uh, with a, lar um, a large cab company um, that there's an employment tribunal um, occurring right now because the software they used um, misrepresented or, or had racial bias. It couldn't detect um, people of color that look like me or, or black. Um, and individuals are fired, and th so therefore there's discrimination. So now that organization is going through um, a, an employment tribunal based on that. Uh, and I'm sure that was surprising, because that cab company didn't write the software. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Thank you. That, that cab, is that working? That co cab company didn't write that particular software. It bought it off the shelf, so it's a third party that's provided software, which is an interesting conundrum, because now it infers that organizations, if you are using AI in some form or fashion, the product that you're buying, if it is going to impact individuals' lives, is that product, has that product got bias in it? And if so, what is it? And what's the consequences? And where does a, where does a line draw? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm very keen to um, hear questions from the audience shortly, but I, I, I guess one uh, last question on my side is, is a little bit back to the who defines what is fair and not fair, and I want to pivot a little bit into the subject of responsibility. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you hold the responsibility for this uh, technology vector that you're developing? I'm very impressed by a quote I read the other day. Uh, it's an American naturalist and biologist called Edward O. Wilson. And he said, um, the problem with humanity's crisis is as follows. We, are, we have paleolithic emotions, medieval institutions, and uh, godlike technology. 
godlike technology, mm. paleolithic emotions, medieval institutions, and godlike technology. So as a leadership coach, my vision is that if I can help leaders uh, develop their consciousness to hold this godlike technology, we're in hopefully in a better place. Mm. But that's a huge ask, right? So what is my own responsibility to work on my own biases? What is the leader's responsibility to work on how do we hold AI in our business? How do you as producers, explorers, developers of AI hold that responsibility? What do you think about that? I'm, I might just, uh, on that rev, we, we um, stumbled upon uh, a product that exhibits less bias than perhaps others, not bias free, but um, a work in progress. And it, it was not an intentional, uh, we, we, we set out to build an engine that, that would be the most accurate. And so um, if you look at the definition of accuracy, um, transcribing words spoken by people with different ethnicities and different genders um, falls into that category. And so f from our standpoint, we've stumbled upon it and we now hold this responsibility to continue to talk about it, to um, educate our, our clients, to, um, uh, to, to continue leading in this space and, 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 and hopefully help uh, lead by example. Um, I don't think that uh, we're, back to your earlier question, I don't think that we're ever going to be completely bias-free, but um, we're constantly having conversations within the company about how to upkeep our um, mentality and our dedication to improving it constantly. And I think what we were talking about a little earlier before the panel was not just the responsibility of, of the leaders, but continuing that responsibility, cascading throughout the organization, inspiring people to want to wanna constantly be going after it. Thank you. Now you, I think you have a point of view. I think you've covered it pretty well. And I mean, generally, it starts with the leadership. It starts with edu an education piece. Um, I mean, to your point, it's not just software. Um, and we're, what we're talking about is software, which, is in f which has data biases, which can affect individuals' lives. So there's an educational piece at the top. But then this permutates throughout the entire organization mm -hmm. and how you encourage and ensure that those practitioners, those individuals that are either buying or building AI, are going through regular training. It can't just be a one-off when they start. It has to be regular, it has to be a constant awareness and looking at some of the, I call it incidents that are happening out there mm -hmm. already that are being well documented and well publicized that this is a, a new technology, it's an exciting technology, but it does need to be treated carefully. Mm. Yeah, Suzanne? Yeah, I'm not going to add anything mm -hmm. super new here. I, I agree with um, both my, my <laughs> fellow panel members. Um, I, I think about, uh, AI is a tool, right, uh, in my mind. So um, to a very blatant analogy maybe, but um, a, a fork, you, you should know what you're using it for, right? You could use it to eat or you could use it to poke somebody's eyes out. You do need to understand <laughs> the tools you're using in a basic sense and make the right decisions in how you use them. And then um, I think there is a role for the leaders and the users, the end users of our product, to uh, want to understand in a basic sense what they're using. There's an absolute responsibility on us to explain it as well as we can and explain how to best use the scores, how best not to use the scores, not to poke somebody's eyes out. <laughs> and, there's a, um, and there's also, I think, a responsibility we have to allow the people that are impacted to understand what we're doing. So we've recently launched an explainability statement and we're very first in the HR industry. I'm really proud of that, to be honest, um, because we're, we're, um, we, we're just doing what's right there. You know, it's maybe not the most attractive thing from a competition point of view that you're throwing your, your um, process out there and explaining really what you're doing in terms of your product, but we feel it's the right thing to do. That way our candidates and our leaders and uh, anyone who's, who uh, encounters our technology gets to see what it's about and gets to ask questions. So it is, it, it's a lot of different parts that together, I believe, create that, that better place, but it's also ongoing work. Yeah. I do agree. I mean, I'll hand over now to the audience, but for me, I think 
it's important riffing on your analogy that we don't try to eat a soup with a fork <laughs> and that actually we realize we had a spoon in our pocket all along mm. right? and so we don't shouldn't miss a trick mm. maybe on that as well so with that stage setting thank you so much um, panel please some questions from the audience we have about 20 minutes so all of you will be able to ask one and I think the way to go about it is the gentleman here in the beginning or the lady please uh, yeah oh um, a riveting panel, thank you for that. Uh, my name is Deepak Parmanand, I work for JP Morgan, and uh, I build AI products day in, day out. So this is you know, me living through all of you. Two questions. Um, in your day-to-day, -day, as you build these products, did you have a bias spot, like a blind spot you were not aware of that in your work uh, you, were, you were made aware and you now know it and you possibly are changing it? I'd like all of you to say one example. Second question is, um, why not use synthetic data to overcome the bias that you see? Have you tried it? Did you not try it? Do you think it's good, not good? That's me. Should I start? Uh, so I, I don't actually, unfortunately, build the algorithms myself. I wish I could, but we have our data science team who does that. I'm on the psychology team. But there is a blind spot that I was made aware of uh, in our product um, when I was working together with one of our partners. So we worked together with a partner called Integrate Autism Employment Advisors, and they work to um, support autistic talent coming onto the job market. And we provide interview questions as part of our product to clients. And we had, um, and what this partner um, helps us with is they review those questions and they give us feedback. So I ran through an exercise like that with them and it was really fascinating. It showed me a lot of my blind spots. So for example, we had a question around team orientation saying, um, tell us about a time you worked with a team on a joint call and what did you do? Tell us about you know, STAR method. And uh, they said, well, the moment you throw in team and goal, autistic talent tends to think about sports. So you kind of derailed them right there. And then we changed that question into, tell us about a time you worked with a group of people on a joint project, and that worked better. Um, so it's just a very simple, relatively small example of, of a total blind spot that I had, um, where bringing in those external points of view is really valuable. I'll start with the first question, and I can address the second one. Um, so the first one, I, I think, look, we're, we're all learning. Um, and not to comment on any organization that I've worked with or, or seen, it's always a journey. And I've always found, and this is why I always divert, divert back to the diversity and inclusion, when you have diverse teams, you spot things very quickly. And I'll use an example like facial recognition. Or, or um, facial recognition historically has not worked well for people of color. Well, if you have people of color on your team, you'll spot pretty quickly in the process that actually it's not working. Um, so, so that's one, it's always a learning journey and when we talk about the, the training that we give, it's continuously updated. So it's not done from a management point of view, it's done by the individuals and the practitioners for the individuals and practitioners. So that's one. In terms of synthetic data, uh, it, it's an interesting one um, and this comes back to the topic of bias uh, and validating your, your models. Who are you validating your models with? If it's against the synthetic data, then that's not representative of the real world. And that's a challenge. And I've seen that there are um, new te technologies available which are generating, um, again with facial recognition, artificial faces, trying to generate synthetic faces that are not real but trying to get a representation. However, they still have bias in it because they're not representative of the real end users. So synthetic data only gets you so far. Mm -hmm. uh, on the first question, um in the context of Rev, we're very lucky to work with partners like HireVue. We also have customers in the police body camera um, industry that are um, helping us pave the way. And uh, first off, they're uh, generating a lot of audio that's challenging. It's out on the street. It's, there's audio hostile environments um, that traditionally make it very challenging for automated speech recognition. So we've had to tune our model to be um, stronger in that realm, um, but I can think of an example of um, a, a French Canadian police officer who was um, speaking with, speaking with someone, and there was sort of wind in the background, 
and um, they alert our, uh, our, our engineering team right away. They show examples. They say, hey, we'd love to get this uh, to a better place. And I think that partnership with, with customers and partners uh, is, is, is critical, right? You don't want the customer to come back and say, oh, oh look, look at this, and you know, how did you not see this in the testing process? This is your fault. I think, at least in our world, there is a sense of uh, joint commitment to identify challenges if they believe that we, Rev, are doing everything that we can to deliver the best product for them, and that's one that is the most accurate in many different um, audio environments and also with many different voices, types of voices, um, then it's a partnership. So it does happen, but we, we almost celebrate it today um, because we get to work closely together. And I don't think I'm qualified to answer this second question. <laughs> from a, uh, from, I would say this, my wish is for an AI that's not bias-free, but an AI that helps me identify the fear that's behind my own bias. Mm. In other words, is there an AI possible at some point that will tell me how to work on myself mm. so I can live more bias-free? Mm. Wouldn't that be cool? I think that would be the ultimate mirroring of the blind spot in the AI back to me, right? And then the work on myself. Mm. But we had another question in the audience. Please, uh, could we have another microphone? Yes, you get a microphone. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Hello. Sophia. I run Tech for Non-Techies. And uh, this is a question for the AI specialist. Um, on your teams, is it mainly machine learning engineers and data scientists, or do you also have non-technical specialists working on these projects? And if you do, then what are the backgrounds of these non-technical specialists, and what, what do they do, and what value do they add? Thank you. Great question, and we have one sitting right <laughs> next to me, me here. So, Suzanne, over to you. Yeah, I, th I think um, indeed Harvey is a nice example of that. So uh, I come from a psychology background, and there's an entire team of us in Hireview, and we collaborate very closely with our data science team, um, who come from a range of backgrounds, but indeed machine learning is one of the key things we do. We also have uh, our engineering team, and we're all together in one big group called Product. Um, and uh, there is, I, I think that the power lies in our collaboration. So we learn from each other. Um, and Sven and I were having a, a chat about this before the session. I think one nice example maybe is that, for example, in bias mitigation, um, an effective way to mitigate could be to treat different groups in your data, men and women, for example, differently, and then to sort of get them to the same kind of outcome score. That will be illegal from a um, in this hiring space in the U.S. context. So the the kind of conversations we'd have is about okay, this is the psychology standard. This is what we also understand about the legal landscape. We also have our legal experts, of course, who also join in on the debate. Um, we come in with uh, this is psychology has shown for decades um, with decades of research that structured interviewing is a really good predictor of job performance. That cognitive ability is a great predictor. And then we go talk to our data scientists about, okay, so how can we use the latest technology to, to automate this, to, to run this, um, yeah, to, to use your skills to make this even better for our candidates and users. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's our day-to-day. -day. Um, and I think it's in the collaboration because I, I think the psychology team doesn't necessarily come with all the technical expertise, but, the te but our technical talent doesn't always have that lens of, okay, what has the research shown works versus not, and also what's important to consider from a practical can-do versus shouldn't-do perspective. Is there anything to add? No, I, I think you've covered it well. Um, I mean, the journey does start with many organizations that I, I tend to visit with, let's hire a data scientist, let's hire a data engineer, and that's all we need. What it ends up with is you have a bunch of technical practitioners, um, so machine learning engineers, DevOps, software engineers, platform engineers, system reliability engineers, so the, the technical expertise. But then you have a number of n other type of profiles that are part of the team, um, including social science, because since we're talking about bias, so social scientists, um, QA, uh, user experience, product. Um, so eventually you have a football team that are completely focused on this particular product, whatever it is. It's not just a model, the model's embedded into something else. So what is that product and how do you evolve it and how do you test it? And on the QA aspect, just to mention that, again, back to the diversity comment, is the QA team are diverse in nature. They're outside in. 
they're not part of the team per se, but they're really there to challenge and they're there to give the lens of or their representation of the real world. Um, we need a microphone, that's for sure. Maybe the gentleman over there. Yeah, thank you. Good morning, thanks. Really interesting panel. Um, so, I mean, the graph at the start in some ways alluded to it, that this reduction of bias is about trying to improve performance. And um, I think it was last year, Dan Kalman of Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow fame talked about actually there are two types of error. Bias is just one type of error. There's obviously also things like noise. And I was just curious to understand, um, and I think you touched upon it in the answering to the first question in some ways, that is our fascination with bias partly about our self-reflection on our human performance and our, and our reflection in that in our modeling, as much as the fact that we think it will give us the quickest route to improving performance and removing a total amount of error? Or should we be looking at noise as well? Where, where do you see that, if you like, uh, incremental model performance coming from? Hmm. May I ask, when you say noise, could you clarify? Yeah, so, so I mean, uh, it, it, you run, run an experiment, you know, a hundred times, or we'll try and calculate something, you get different teams to calculate something a hundred times, they'll all give you slightly different answers, right? There's an there's a error range, if you like, on that exact answer. So that's noise, the, you know, you, I don't need to describe bias, but so, so there are two ways of trying to reduce error, essentially, and that's what he was getting at, that you can have a systemic issue where the error is always one-sided, that's the sort of bias, mm. or you can get more of a spread, and that's the noise. I mean, in my mind, it's both. It is a, a, the aim is to reduce both, right? Um, because there's a, the noise piece to me. Uh, maybe I'm, I'm overinterpreting your question, but to me, it's more the accuracy piece, like actually being able to really get read as well as possible the data point you're trying to predict. Um, and then there's the bias, the sort of systemic. Mm, yeah, in, in this context, giving different people different kinds of scores, which isn't fair, so that's sort of from, more from an ethical point of view. So uh, they are, they're both important, and I think we, we get really excited when we make headway on either of those points. Um, but I, I do think uh, uh, it's a fair point to say there is... Um, it's really interesting. I loved your point earlier, Sven, about couldn't, you know, an AI that might predict our blind spots. There are some more philosophical questions to ask about this stuff that are interesting around uh, we are here mirroring society and then we're being super critical of a technology that's mirroring a wider issue. And yes, it's important to address the, the technology and get it as right as possible, but we're also talking about a bigger, a bigger societal challenge at large, otherwise it wouldn't typically even creep into. I mean, AI is not inherently biased, right? And I think that's where my fascination lies, is that AI in some ways, in its imperfection, is a mirroring of our own imperfection. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at our own externalized version. And for that reason, I said what I said is that, wouldn't it be cool then if we can work on ourselves in such a way that the AI comes out of a place that is more resolved, more integrated, whatever it is. I think also, as long as we look at AI to tell us what to do, we are also abdicating the very responsibility we need to acquire to work on ourselves. Mm -hmm. That's the other danger in AI, in my view, that, that looking at this engine somehow gives us more answers than the ones we find in ourselves, mm -hmm. is my perspective, but I don't know if you have a... No, I think, I think you've, all, you've covered it well. Um, AI, uh, computers, they're not biased, it's humans. It's humans in the process and how you actually create the AI. So it's just, you're right, it's magnifying, but then it comes back to my original question, which is how do you define what fair is? And it's a hard question. I, I'm not gonna dismiss it. And it's one that leaders need to really reflect on yeah. before they even start tackling, I'm gonna build some software that's gonna do this. Yeah. The gentleman here in front, yeah. Um, we ask Radio 8 B2B. Um, I was wondering, do you think that these engines should be independently audited in the same way that financial accounts are? And is, given your point about fairness, is that even possible? Good question. 
We have been audited. <laughs> by whom? Yeah, by various parties. We've actually uh, voluntarily entered into a couple of audits because we believe that helps us with our blind spots. Uh, so we engaged in an audit with O'Neill's, um, uh, it's called ORCA, I can't remember exactly what all the, all the letters stand for, but uh, Kathy O'Neill's, so the author of Weapons of Mass Destruction, she has a consultancy and she came in, looked at our algorithms and concluded it looks good. She also gave us some useful points of improvement that we've been working on since. We then voluntarily invited Richard Landers, who's a big name in the I.O. psychology world, brought in him, and him in and said, hey, can you give us an I.O. audit? Um, which was just something we wanted to do and see if he had some improvements. And actually, he's been working with us since on some of our pieces because he got fascinated by the technology and, again, gave us really good feedback, also some points of improvement that we're now collaborating on with him. And then you have those partners like the Integrate Autism Advisors I was talking about earlier. So we do lots of that because we feel um, that's useful. And, so, and yes, I would say it is a good practice. We also have an uh, expert board that we sense check stuff with on a regular basis. Um, because you have one lens, so you get excited about your own stuff, and you, of course, you're biased in reviewing your results because you want them to work. So, yeah, bringing in those uh, independent experts is really worthwhile. Guys, auditing, regulation? I would just say that I'm, I think, yes, um, if we, and it'll help probably if we, if we expand our definition of compliance, right? You talk about the financial industry, um, and if if part of being compliant, maybe I was talking with Nayer or, or um, a colleague from Quantum Black yesterday, if we expand our definition of, of compliance to include um, uh, a level of, of uh, work that hopefully results in exhibiting the least bias as possible, that might help us, uh, uh, at least from a framework perspective and how we approach it. Um, but I have to say, I'm, I'm very surprised and a little alarmed that m more of our customers do not ask for they're, they're usually, uh, and not surprisingly, interested in cost, um, quality, um, uh, and, and in that may be you know, uh, uh, accuracy uh, across all different types of voices. Um, but I think uh, the fact that we don't see it asked for, don't, don't, don't see uh, companies asking for third-party reports um, is, a, is a little bit alarming, to be quite honest. Nothing. I, I think you both covered it. Um, the, the only angle I would say is that you have the e, EUA, EU AI Act, which is coming soon. It's in a draft. You've got Brazil and China already leading the way. Um, the FCA in the US wrote a blog post um, probably about a year ago now saying, if your AI is not fair, we're coming after you. Like, and it's, it's pretty out there, it's blunt. And, and that scared a number of organizations enough to know that, look, something's coming. Um, we need to get our house in order. We need to really treat this with care. And we're back to what is fair. Mm -hmm. um, just behind the gentleman here, just uh, my, another microphone, please, in the second row. Thank you. Hello. Um, I'm wondering to what extent we're seeing this as an imperative at the board level beyond the area of HR where it has to be. Uh, and is there investment actually going into this area? And if so, who are the leadership kind of execs who own this? Is it product innovation? Is it governance? Is it a collaboration? Really interested to, to understand also if this is being also linked to data where there is also inherent bias. So it, it should be really a holistic approach. Or risk even, huh? Could be Indeed. the risk function, yeah. <laughs> I'll give two answers on that, and, and I'm seeing this at, at board level um, in various organizations, but with two lenses. One is on the risk lens. So the comment I just made about the, the FCA um, um, going up, potentially could go after organizations. If you were sitting on a board and you knew you were building or didn't know how much, how much AI you were building, but it had impact, you would want to know from a risk point of view, how much am I exposed and what are we doing to mitigate that and what are we processes we put in place? So that's a risk lens. The other lens is if you're building a product, I mean, it's in your interest to build a product that actually serves the many rather than the few. And I would think that you would want to serve more customers, you would want your product to work for more and you would not want the, the, to exclude anyone and you wouldn't want the noise out there or the negative press that actually is excluding 
uh, individuals. So I think also from a product innovation point of view and a product point of view, you'd really want to focus on good business. So um, I've seen this really at, at, at board level, these conversations. Who owns it? It's, uh, I think it's an evolving area. Mm. So I think that's an excellent question. Yeah. And, and I see that uh, more generally, the pressure on boards becomes higher in terms of their accountability um, and responsibility. And they're not equipped currently to fully own that. Mm -hmm. Also because their own knowledge, as you alluded to, uh, is, is beyond understanding of what the very AI will produce and impact that they're funding. And, and so it creates a whole new level of leadership requirement at board level, I believe, that, uh, uh, that we're just about to explore. But, um, but we're far away, I think, from really understanding what it means for, for boards. It's a highly exciting subject. And a great opportunity for investors. Mm. I'll make uh, our lovely organizers who did such a great job with this show and, uh, and conference um, very happy by concluding just on time. Uh, I want to thank the audience for their great questions. I want to thank the panel for their wonderful contributions. It was a great pleasure. There's a lot of energy around the subject. I hope it will continue behind uh, the curtain there. And uh, we're obviously here to field any more questions behind the curtain. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.